Got a couple of questions here. But I'm dropping all over the place. <clears throat> Does Mark 16, 18 refer to literal snakes and poison, or do these represent demonic powers? Yes, on both accounts. It is physical, it is reality, and there is a spiritual application to it also. However, uh, we do see um, in it is not in a sense of demonstration per se. When you're taking up serpents, it's like what Paul did when he was bit, shook it off, it did not affect him. In other words, it's not like typically uh, just, you know, bring in the crates of rattlesnakes and let's, you know, get them out and show how much faith we have. Um, now, if you want to do that, that's fine, you know, and I'll be glad to pray for you later. So, <laughs> but yeah, it is literal and there is symbolic aspect to it too. Now, can someone who has been cremated be raised from the dead? Yes, according to your faith, be it unto you. Right, real simple. I mean, that <laughs> sounds real um, vague, but the example we have from Scripture was that Abraham was going, he took wood for a burnt offering that he was going to offer up Isaac on, and so he, as a matter of fact, the Scripture even said that he had received him as back from the dead, meaning that because he knew he was going to be, he was going to kill him and then burn him, believing that God could raise him up even from the ashes if need be. So there is, you know, faith is unlimited. Uh, well, let me put it this way: I, I just did a, a message at our home church called the Faith Breaker, and when I say breaker, I mean like an electric breaker, you know, like a breaker box. God is all powerful, and right. Is there anything God cannot do? No. Now, so why isn't everything getting done? It's because, see, we always look at it like God pours his power down and his power down and does something there. He doesn't pour his power down, he pours his power out. So what gets done, the power of God, God himself is not limited. The power of God is limited by humans. You have a breaker. You have a limit to your faith. That limit is your breaker. Everybody's breaker is different. And you have to learn how to get a bigger breaker so that more power can flow through before it, before it actually flips your breaker. Right? So basically it comes in like a big funnel and has to come through you, but it is filtered through you. Now, and I, I don't have time to get into this too much, but I, I do want to share this bit with you. Faith is an amazing thing in that the generation I was raised in, cartoons were quite a bit different than they are today. They had stuff like Felix the Cat, remember? And he had that magic bag, right? That, and, and the, yeah, and he, 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 remember he pulling that bag and whatever he needed, that bag became, right? Now, if you wanted to take the gospel and apply it to that, well, the bag would be the Holy Spirit. Whatever you need, the Holy Spirit becomes, right? Now, we have examples of gifts, but those gifts are not gifts in the sense of what we think is gifts, but the Bible says they are manifestations of the Spirit. And so each gift is not just a gift like I give you an ink pen. Here's, here's a gift, okay? There you go. Now, you got the gift. It's not that. There is a gift that's given, and you can operate the gift. However, every time you operate the gift, it is, that gift is a manifestation of the Spirit of God. So in other words, whatever need you have, he shapes himself to become the answer to that need. Right? Now, because of that, whatever you need, now, here's where you get kind of into the science of it. What you're believing when you pray or minister, as much as big as your faith breaker is, because God's power is unlimited, right? As big as your breaker is, that's how much power can flow through. What you're believing at the moment you're praying is the shape that that power will take, right? So if you're believing for total healing and the person only asks for their heart to be healed, then you will get total healing. But if you only ask for, and let's say if they have, you know, two things wrong, and you're only believing for one, then only one 
gets taken care of. But when you learn to get a bigger breaker and you can say, God can heal it all, be healed, as opposed to one little area, then they can be healed totally. But now they are healed according to the proportion of your faith. So God pours his power through a person, through you, into this person, and whatever they need, how big your faith breaker is, is how much of the power of God that comes through and it becomes as close to the shape you need based on how much faith you have. You see how portion it like that? And that, what, that's why sometimes when you pray for people, you see instant healing. Sometimes you see progressive. Sometimes you see differing degrees. It's because his power is unlimited, but he's pouring through us, and we have differing degrees of breakers. And what we believe as we're praying According to that breaker, it has to be poured through. So if you need, you know, you might have to pray three or four times to get to allow enough power to add up to get the job done. Okay? So if you've been in the DHT, you would have a good idea of this because we teach this in the DHT. But recently I taught this as, as a, a message at my church because I'm trying to grow my church up to where we take away the breaker all together and just allow pure power just flow. Amen? That's why faith is so important because even Dr. Lake said between faith and power go after faith because faith directs power. See, faith is the tracks that the train of power runs on. Wherever you lay the tracks, the train will go. So you determine the power of God, where it goes, and how it is applied based on the tracks you lay. And those tracks are faith. Okay? So that's what we're trying, that's where we're trying to go. Now, all right. <clears throat> so next, real quick. If someone is obviously oppressed and physically ill, but when you have asked them if you can pray for them, and they say no, do you leave them sick and oppressed? No. You can pray from a distance. And you can set them free. Because first off, when you ask a person... Can I pray for you? You already said they're oppressed. If they say no, how do you know that's not a lying devil talking to you? How do you know it's them? Nobody in their right mind would refuse help. So if they say no, obviously it's the devil. You know, even if they're not demon possessed and foaming at the mouth or whatever, they're still under the influence, right? You can still set them free. You know, well, first off, maybe your problem was asking them. Who says you have to ask? Jesus didn't ask several times. There were times when he said, you know, what do you want to do for you? But that was after they came to him. But when he saw the woman, it said when he saw the woman bowed over, it says when he saw her, he called her to him. So there she was coming in the back of the synagogue, and he says, woman, you, bowed over, yeah, come here. And when she got up there, all he said to her was, you are loosed from your infirmity. He didn't say, how much faith do you have? He didn't say, do you want to be healed? He didn't say, you know, to it, do you think it's God's will for you to be healed today? He didn't say any of that stuff. He, see, that's the difference between what we teach and what is averagely taught in healing. We believe that Jesus knew what he was doing when he gave us authority. Almost all other types of healing do not believe that. They, believe, they say it, but they don't believe it. That's the difference. We believe that when we got baptized with the Holy Ghost, that an authority and, and an ability came. The authority came when you got born again. The ability to do it at will comes with the baptism of the Spirit. And we believe we have that authority and that ability to give it away freely. And that, see, here's the difference too. Most people in healing are trying to get the people fixed morally. We're not doing that. Now, do we want you fixed morally? You betcha. Okay? But you're trying to combine something that was separated. Right? Because Jesus bore the stripes. That's for healing. Then he poured out his blood. That's for sin. Therefore, sin and sickness are separated by two different cures. You get that? I understand it's one, you know, the sin brought it all. I understand that. But most people are trying to get you fixed. They're trying to, to apply the blood to get you fixed so that the stripes will take effect and you can be healed. We believe that 
if Jesus bore our stripes and by his stripes were healed, then if he, remember, because after he was whipped, he went back to Pilate, and then Pilate said, I'm going to let him go, and he ended up refusing and basically ended up getting crucified. What if Pilate had sent him on his way? What if he didn't get crucified? Then you'd still be in your sin, right? There'd be no redemption. But healing would still be a fact. Because healing didn't come on the crucifixion. Healing came by his stripes. Isn't that right? See, that's where people miss the authority of Jesus. People are trying, you're, they're trying to get, people think generally in healing teachings that they're trying to get the people to accept it. The people have to have faith for it. The people have to receive it or have to get good enough or get forgiveness or give forgiveness or get fixed before they can be healed. Okay? Healing was paid for before their sins. Jesus was whipped before he was crucified, and Jesus never used healing as a coercion to get people to live right. Why do you do it? You represent him. As a representative, you have no right to say anything or do anything that he did not or would not say. You're adding to the gospel. The Bible says, heal the sick. It says, go in, tell them, the kingdom of God has come near you, then set them free. Heal the sick. See, you're trying to deal with Christians and trying to counsel them as opposed to enforcing the atonement and the price that was paid for their healing and to exercise that against an enemy. That's because you don't understand warfare. We are at war. It's a kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of God. We are his forces. We have authority over them. Sickness and, and disease is under Satan's category. So therefore we have authority over it and we can drive it out, cast it out, get rid of it. They don't have, the people don't have to consent to prayer. They don't, are the people going to consent to prayer whenever Jesus comes back? Or is he going to rule with a rod of iron? Is he going to cast Satan and all of them into the pit and all that kind of stuff? Is he going to do that? Is he going to ask the people? Do you mind if I cast your devils out? What, what authority is he operating under? His, right? Whose authority are you operating under? Then why do you keep trying to tell the party line of some group that tells you what to believe? Say what he said. Do you get that? Isn't it simple? It's just warfare. Simple warfare. Sickness, disease, killing, stealing, all that stuff. That's all the devil. It's an enemy of the church, an enemy of the body of Christ, an enemy of the kingdom of God. You represent that kingdom. Go after it. Destroy it anywhere you see it. Find it. Set the people free. Isn't that easy? That's what he said. He said, I have come to bring deliverance to the captives. Right? He didn't say, I've come to ask them if they want to be free. None of that stuff. And even if he did, the beauty of it is now, we're going to do greater works. Isn't that right? See, that's what, you, that's what this teaching is going to do. It's going to bring you into an aspect of warfare that kind of blends it so that you start to understand the authority that you truly have. That's what this, but you have to understand, it is war. It's an actual fight. There are actual casualties. I hate it, but there's times when there's casualties. There doesn't have to be, but invariably there will be. But you have to decide if you're going to be a casualty. Like they say, are you a victim or a victor? Because Jesus decreed you to be a victor. So if you decide to be a victim, you're not in his plan. Do you understand that? You have deviated from the plan. His plan is to conform you to the image of Christ, who is above everything. Everything will bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Isn't that simple? I'm telling you, that. people say, this message is too good. I know, that's why it's called the gospel. <laughs> this is the gospel. This is it. Simple as that. So, all right. Now, <clears throat> now we're back into the session on the enemy's tactics. In, uh, yeah. There it says, he usually exploits your weakness by influencing someone to do what it takes to set you off. Now, everybody knows that to be true, right? Let me give you a couple of examples. So, therefore, your job is to die to the point that nothing sets you off. So that's why a lot of times, when I'm, there, when I'm places, people come up, well, so, well, you know, I just, I'm supposed to forgive, but I can't. Why not? Well, you don't know what they did. And it's easy to say forgive, but you don't know what they did. Okay, when you're saying that, you're telling me all this stuff. But what I'm hearing is, and I'm not dead yet, and I don't want to die. 
I want to keep my feelings. I want to keep hurting. I want to do all this stuff, and I don't want to forgive, and I don't, because I'm not dead, because a dead person doesn't talk that way. A dead person doesn't complain, doesn't care what anybody thinks, says, or does to them. Yeah, but you, see, that's, that's the basic problem. Again, this ain't a DHT, but it's kind of hard to stay out of it. The basic difference between what we teach in healing and the average teaching. First off is, people, most people blend the Old and New Testament. And they try to fit it all together so it all works out. And they try to make the God of the Old Testament fit with the God of the New Testament. And they try to show, and you have to realize that God in the Old Testament dealt with fallen man the way he had to, the way a just and holy God had to deal with fallen man. Not the way he wanted to, but the way he had to. In the New Testament, because Jesus paid the price, God gets to deal with man the way he wants to. Because his wrath has been put on Jesus. So he gets to treat everybody good. Do you get that? Now, here's the problem. Most types of healing is still trying to deal with Old Testament or Old Covenant principles. Rather than understanding the new birth. You say, oh, no, yeah, but see, it's this generational curse. If I get that broke off me, I'll be good. Okay, how do you get a generational curse broken off? Well, I don't know. The book that I've read on it that says to do this. Well, the book I've read on it says you ain't got a generational curse. Because, <laughs> a matter of fact, the book I've read right here says that, see, the, what you don't read in the books about generational curses is that at the very, after all the things it says, you go down to the third and the fourth generation, all that kind of stuff, after all that, Later in Ezekiel, which is the last time it's mentioned, it says, never again will it be mentioned in Israel the saying that the father eats the sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And it goes right into the generational curse teaching, the basis of it, and says, you will never say that again. Well, how come we keep saying it? You see? And people say, well, yeah, but it is a generational curse. No, it's not. You don't have a generation. Why? Because you got born again. When you got born again, your generation stopped. You don't have a da daddy and granddaddy and great granddaddy. No, you got a heavenly father. And all good and perfect gifts come from him. And all good blessings come down from him. And you're blessed with every blessing in heavenly places. And who can curse whom God is blessed? Even Balaam, a false prophet, knew that. How come the church is too stupid? Can't figure that out. If God's blessed you, who can curse you? Do you see? Your whole problem goes back. You don't understand what happened to new birth. You don't really think you got born again. You really think you still got some ancestry. I don't have any ancestry. My generation goes back to one person, Jesus. That's it. And there ain't no generational curses coming through him. Why? He became a curse for me. Do you see that? Amen. That's why I'm free. And I don't worry about all this stuff. But, you know, you want to read books on it? Then go ahead. Keep your curses. And you'll keep trying to figure out how, and it becomes a whole industry. And you have to figure out, oh, I need the right prayer incantation to break this curse. And I need a, a, a certain prayer to break this curse. And it's a bunch of nonsense. See, you ain't got a generational curse. You may, you may have personal sin that you need to stop. But now the sin, if, if you got some kind of thing that looks like a curse, it's because you're sinning. It ain't a curse, it's a sin. Do you get that? It's not your daddy's fault, it's your fault. Quit sinning. The Bible says, every soul that sins, it shall die. Nobody sins for you, and you're not getting the benefit of the sin. Live right, do right, do what you're supposed to do, die. When you die, the curse of the law can no longer be on you because you're dead. Because the, the curse of the law stops at death. So you die and live in resurrection life. See, most people are trying to live resurrection life without going through a death. Can't have a resurrection until you have a death. So just die. Isn't this simple? Man, see, it's free. And it's amazing, too. It'll save you a whole bunch of money. <laughs> Isn't it right? I'm telling you, I, some of these things, I, I have to be careful. I get wrapped up in this stuff. I will, I will end up doing a DHT the next three days. Because I'm telling you, that, that stuff just grits on me. So, die until nothing sets you off. Now, Galatians 5, 19 through 20 tells you, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
oh yeah, but you know, I'm not really a drunken, I, I just have a problem drinking. No, you're drunk, and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Get free. Don't live in it. Don't, it's, not your, it's not a problem. It's a sin. There was something they were saying on television the other day about, what was it, drug abuse, drug addiction, and alcoholic addiction, or diseases. Let me tell you something. God never sent a person to hell over a disease. It's over sin, and you choose to send yourself there. So it's not a disease. It's a sin. Stop it. Well, I can't. That's a lie. If it's a sin, you can stop. Simple as that. So, <clears throat> now, but the fruit, now, why don't I read these to you? Because these are the tactics the enemy uses. You know, you, you are, anybody here ever heard what they used to call gotcha vines? You know what gotcha vines are? Okay, yeah, see, if you've been in the jungle, you know what gotcha vines are. There's these little bitty vines. They're not big. They're little bitty, and there are a whole bunch of them, and they usually lay just about maybe a half a foot over the earth, and they're kind of thick and wrapped up and all tangled up together. And you'll be walking, and if there's one little bitty vine, no problem, man, you'll rip right through that. But when they get a whole bunch of them, and you start walking through them, it hangs you, and it's, what is it? It's, oh, gotcha, well, oh, gotcha. That's what it's, that's why they call them gotcha vines, because they hang you up. Individually, you can rip through any of them, but when you get a whole bunch of them, then they end up holding you up. That's what these are. That's what the enemy does. He tries to get this tactic. He'll try to get adultery. Bam. That's one little gotcha vine. He'll try to get fornication next. That's another one. Now the vines are thicker. Uncleanness. That's an, you see, it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And you get into it, and pretty soon you're thinking, well, okay, this is just one thing. I can break this. That's no problem. But then one thing leads to another, and then one thing leads to another. And why? Because sin is never satisfied. It always says, do more, get more, have more, something. It always says, dig deeper. That's the gotcha part. And pretty soon you look back and you're a thousand miles from where you started and you thought, how did I ever get here? That's why when I was dealing with that guy the other day that was on meth, that was his big deal. I don't know how I ended up like this. I looked at myself and I don't know how I ended up here. I was so different. And I, never, I said, you did it one day at a time. And you keep doing it. <clears throat> and it started with one thing and ended up with two things and three things. Almost all sins are interactive. You know, there, there are sins that run together. You know, drinking, smoking, you know, they run together. Why? And, and, you know, they say pot is a, you know, marijuana is a gateway drug. And why? Because they run together. And one thing leads to another. After a while, that didn't do enough for you. You start going to something else. It's the same thing. That's the enemy's tactics. But he could care less about you. He just wants you to stay dead in your sins. He wants you to stay ineffective for the kingdom of God, and he could care less what misery or anything else you go through. It has, you're not so important that he's planning and plotting on you particularly, but he's got these things that he can always apply, and these are his tactics. So whenever you, next time you're in <clears throat> some place and there's a rack of magazines, and there's you know, half-dressed women on it, instead of standing there reading them, turn your back or turn them around or do something else. Why? Because that's how he tries to get in. He gets in the, the, the different gates. <clears throat> and he'll try to get you to where you see it, then you'll think about it, then you do it. Maybe a long drive in between, but that's the path. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, let me grab some water here. <clears throat> Took off my other one. <clears throat> Man, <clears throat> there we go. I always have people ask me, do you want cold water or room temperature? Room temperature. Speakers should have room temperature, especially like me. Because if I drink cold water, I'll drink it. And then my voice will start doing weird things. <laughs> <coughs> and it's real hard to maintain that authority when you're saying, so cast him out. <coughs> cast him out. That's, see, so you have to learn warm room temperature water, okay? <laughs> You see, that's what the enemy tries to do. Is he tries to hook you up, and he tries to draw you off, and draw you deeper and deeper. What's he trying to do? He's, he, he goes about as a, as a lion. Isn't that right? What's he doing? He's following the herd. And he tries to get you separated from the herd. Then he'll run you until you're so weak and tired from running that you just give up and there's no fight left in you. Then he moves in for the kill. That's what he does. And I'm not telling you, well, you're saying we ought to be in church every Sunday. 
I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you shouldn't be. I'm just not telling you safety is being in church. Because you can be in church and still be lost and still be off and gone. And some churches you go to, man, they lead you to sin because of low standards. And they'll tell you, you're okay. You don't have to have a standard when you do have standards. You say, well, you know, what's the standard? Anything Jesus wouldn't do, you shouldn't do. Simple as that. And anything he did do, you should do. There you go. That's the upper and level and lower levels of the standard. Amen? Isn't that simple? See, when you get, things should be simplified. Now, he says, <clears throat> But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. He, I used to think, isn't that weird that he put at the end of those statements that against those things there's no law. And I thought, why would he say there's no law against them? And then one day as I was preaching, it came out, and I was like, what? Do you know what that means? <clears throat> Look up here. You go up to the top part, adultery, there's a law against it. You do it, you're wrong. Right? Next one, fornication. You do it, you're wrong. There's a law against it. Now, go down to the fruit of the Spirit. Love. You know what that means? No law against it. You can love all you want. God is not going to get mad at you if you love somebody. As long as it doesn't lead to adultery or fornication. Right? Now, yeah. joy. Do you realize you can have all the joy that you can handle? And there's no law. There's no limits. See, sin is breaking the limits. There's no limit. You can have love. You can have joy. You can have all the peace. Isn't that right? You can have long-suffering. I mean, think about it. You can put up with people all you want to. Isn't that right? There's no law against you putting up with people. God is never going to say, shouldn't have put up with them that long. Isn't that right? He said, it was up to you. I wouldn't have put up with that long, but you did, so that's okay. He said, well, God would never say that. Oh, yeah? Jesus did. Jesus said, how long do I have to suffer you? Isn't that right? You know what that means? He was getting towards the ends of his long suffering. <laughs> right? And he was telling them, how long I got to put up with you? You unbelieving, perverse generation? Isn't that right? But he said, there's no law against that stuff. Now, when you now think about that. If there's no law against love, that means you can love anybody. Now, tie that back. Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength. And your neighbor as yourself. That means you can love your neighbor as yourself all you want, and you'll never get in trouble. And if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself all you want, that means that you can, what? You're going to treat them the way you want to be treated. If you were sick, would you want to be healed? Yep. So if you love them, you're going to go heal them. And you can heal them all you want, and God won't care. That knocks out that lead in this world. I'm not led to go pray. For See, I can knock that thing out a thousand different ways. Why? Because it is a false doctrine to think that you have to be led the way you think you have to be led to go minister to somebody. All you're called to do is love them. Oh, no man, nothing but to love them. How do you love them? Treat them the way you want to be treated. If they have a need, would you want that need? No, then get rid of it off of them too. This is the rule. This is it. That's, you don't have to know, ten, you know the Ten Commandments and 10,000 laws. All you have to know is, I, I love God. How do I love God? By loving my fellow man. That's how I show God I love him, by loving my fellow man. How do you love your fellow man? Whatever need he has, I treat him like I would want to be treated if I had that need. And I just go get rid of it. That's it. That's all the Christianity you need right there. If you do that little part right there, you will never violate a law. You will be in God's will the rest of your life. And when you die or go to heaven or however it happens, you will receive, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You will get that. Why? Because that's what he said. See? So, but all this, all this other stuff, you're just trying to be spiritual. See, you're trying, and usually your level of spirituality is somehow in relationship or in some kind of competition or judgment or comparison with the people you run around with. But if you just go back to the Bible, it's real simple. Your, your, your competition is yourself. How do you want to be treated? That's what you got to do. Isn't that simple? See, I'm telling you, when I found this stuff out, you talk about excited. See, that's why I run all over the country like I do. 272,000 miles on my Tahoe. That's what I got on it right now. Why? Because we go everywhere. I go all the time. Why? Because this is too good a message to hold to myself. Right. Man, it changes lives. And it's right with the Bible. There's messages that change lives that ain't right. You hear them all? Turn on Christian television. You hear it anytime. But you've got to get the right message. Isn't that right? 
Well, you know, I don't think our doctrine really matters. I think all that matters is that we, that we just love one another. Paul told Timothy, take heed to your doctrine, for by it you save yourself and others also. So if your doctrine ain't right, you ain't saved. And you can't save others. So doctrine is important. So, all right. He says, <clears throat> and they that, have, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, how does the enemy try to hit? There's all kinds of ways, but I put a couple of there at the bottom of the page. There's depression. Why? Because if he can get you depressed, he stops your effectiveness. You won't reach out. You won't try to help people. You know, it's like I've said before, it's amazing. One of the primary ways that Satan tries to stop people and tries to, his tactics is just fear. Fear of man, fear of failure, fear of loss of reputation, all those fears. And many times, you know, like we said before, the number one fear, of, I mean, for years, is the fear of public speaking. That has been the number one fear throughout history, basically, as long as they've recorded it. So the number one fear is the fear of public speaking. And isn't it funny how the number one fear in all humanity directly corresponds with the number one job God has given us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, so automatically we know that that fear is not of God. Isn't that right? That's a tactic he uses to keep you from being effective in the kingdom. All these things aren't about you. It's about your effectiveness for the kingdom. Next, hopelessness. He'll try to get you to worry. He tries to get your to keep your mind on things of the world and get you tied up in the things of the world. But the Bible says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. Isn't that what God said? So if, you, if I hear you're worrying, what does that tell me? You've not been keeping your mind stayed on him. That's why you're not in perfect peace. Keep your mind stayed on him. You won't, have, you won't be out of peace if your mind is stayed on him. But if your mind is on the things of the world, carnally minded, guess what? Your mind isn't on him, and he's not going to keep you in perfect peace. And if you look on the things of the world, the Bible even says in the last days that men's hearts will fail them for fear of the things they see coming upon them. Why? Well, why? You know, first off, I can tell you, those people are not Christian because their mind is not stayed on him. Their mind is on the things of the world. What is the world? What has the situation in the world got to do with you? See, only if you're bound to this world. I've gone in places... <clears throat> been where I, sh I say I shouldn't have been based on the circumstances I shouldn't have been there but I've always come out whole and that's why I tell people you can't beat me I've lost everything I've owned three different times I I've run cars and especially in the early years man you know I, I, I bought basically throwaway cars and because they were mostly dead before I got them anyway <laughs> and so I'd run them till they were dead and get another one that was you know couple of hundred dollars, go to that one, died, and then I found out, oh, you, you actually have to change the oil? Okay, well, <laughs> once I learned that, it's funny, all of a sudden my car should have lasted longer. <laughs> I did not have a car anointing, let me tell you. There is no car anointing there. I, but, <clears throat> I, because when everybody else was learning how to work on cars, I was either doing martial arts or studying the Bible. That's what I did, you know, and I always figured, well, if I study martial arts, I can trade off lessons for car work, or when I was Stayed in the Bible, if somebody was sick, I could pray for them and they could fix my car. No way to work out either. You see, a barter system works real good. So, but the enemy will always try to puff you up or push you down. He'll always try to make you think you're special, you're something, you're highly anointed and you're different. No, you ain't. We're all the same. The only person that's different is Jesus. And our whole job is to quit being like us. I had a guy one time say, you're trying to make everybody like you. No, I'm not. I don't even want to be like me. <laughs> I'm trying to make everybody like him. And I'm trying to be like him. Isn't that right? So that's the whole point is getting away from us. So <clears throat> Dr. Summerall used to always say, other people's minds is a terrible place to put your happiness. <laughs> and I learned that. That's why, you know, if you like me, great. If you don't, it really doesn't matter as long as I tell you the truth. Right. I'd rather you go out here mad at me and do what you're supposed to do than to go out saying good things and, well, that was a nice seminar and you go back and sit down and, Go home, watch Married with Children or whatever it is that's on TV now. See, I'd much rather have you mad. I'd rather provoke you to anger. Because the Bible says to provoke one another to good works. Well, provoke usually means make mad. 
So if I have to make you mad to where you go out and do good works, I'll do it. Because in a couple of days, I'll be leaving. Right? And I don't have to deal with you. Amen? You know, David said that one time. And he's probably going to hear it. David Hogan used to tell people, see, you're going to come down there to Mexico, and you're going to come down there and stay a couple of weeks, and you're going to stir up a bunch of devils, and, then, and stir up a bunch of fights, and then you're going to come back to the States, and I've got to stay there and fight the devils. He said, I don't need you coming down. And I thought, wait a minute. That's what David does. He comes up from Mexico and comes up here and stirs up a bunch of devils and he leaves and leaves us to fight. So there ain't no difference. I said, we're going to go down and stir up some devils for him and leave. So it works the same way. So. <laughs> so. Now, the enemy's best weapon against you is usually those of your own household. You need to get a hold of this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not. Now you hear that? It's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Don't you think this. What? That I am come to send peace on earth. I, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Then how come all we have in the church is a bunch of doves? See, I, I run into trouble all the time just because certain things the way I say them. People say, well, you're a Christian. You can't be for the death penalty. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Mess with the kid. And I'll show you. I'll pull, I'll pull a trigger, pull a lever, push a button, whatever it takes. You ain't got no right to ruin that kid's life. And it, it stays with them. And then I end up dealing with them 20 years later after they've gone through all kinds of stuff because you messed with them because you had some lust devil that got you going on them or something and got garbage going on. Yeah, you know, I, 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 see, I, I was going to be a police officer. And I, am, I know why God did not let me. Okay? Because I, I would have a prison ministry. Because I, from the inside. Okay? Because like I said before, it'd be one of those things where, you know, yeah, I went out to arrest the child molester and uh, he just felt so bad about it, he shot himself six times. <laughs> Wrestled my gun away and then shot himself and... Because <laughs> I'm telling you, you say, well, d but you're supposed to pray for them. That's right, I will. I'll give them time to repent. And then I'll shoot them. Okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> but the reason I say that is because the Bible says, in Romans, it says that the authorities are to wield the sword not in vain, but so that evildoers may fear. Well, that's what that does. God gave the death penalty. You know, there's no prison system in the Bible. It's, all, it's either restitution or death. That's it. And believe it or not, every, see, the thing is, Christians try to make everybody under grace. Not all under grace. There's law there, too. When you come, see, law ends with Christ. If you're not in Christ, law doesn't end. You're still under eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Yeah, see, that's a little different slant on things. But the fact is, there has to be law. You know, if you want your kids running around with child molesters, that's fine. You move down with them. But I'm telling you, and, and they're, <laughs> the recidivism rate is outrageous, right? There's no, there's no fixing them. Now, they can be healed. God can deliver, all right? But, barring God, there is no hope, all right? So, all right, I'll get off my political aspect. We'll get back into preaching. So... <clears throat> He goes on. He says, I am, now notice this, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now, Jesus himself said that you are to honor your mother and your father. That's the first commandment given with a promise. You know, right? That your life might be long upon the earth. But he says right here he's going to bring difference and a variance between them. Do you, now, do you know what that tells you? That's the, that shows that you can be at variance with a person and still give them honor. Isn't that right? Because he's not going to tell you to do opposite. So, he says here, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. He that receives you receives me, then he that receives me receives him that sent me. Now notice, the enemy does not usually attack your weakness immediately, 
He lets it wait. I've already shared on this. Usually he will wait and watch and he'll, he will bring it to exposure when it benefits him, not when it's beneficial for you. If you're not going to do anything for the kingdom of God against Satan, he'll usually let your sin or your vice, etc. work against you slowly over time. And he will allow the principle of sowing and reaping to work against you. But if he sees that you're likely to do something for the kingdom of God or that you're headed in that direction and something against him, he will not usually wait for sowing and reaping to take effect. He will begin actively working towards your downfall. If tribulation does not immediately begin, it is either because he is devising a suitable method of attack and or God in his mercy is holding him off, giving you time to get right or to get strong. Remember, the enemy is a defeated foe. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can beat him. Right? You can beat him. That now, See, a lot of these statements are real simple, but if you ever take them and just really read them and believe them, it, it, it will have to change your theology. Because if you really believe that you can beat him, then you can't say, well, but I couldn't help myself. You can't say that. And you can't say, well, God is using this and God allowed it. No, it's you didn't. You, you trace your troubles back. It didn't go back to God doing something. It goes back to you not doing something or you doing something wrong. That's where they go back to. 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. And John, the Apostle John's writing says, I write unto you fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Notice verse 14. I have written unto you fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men, because you are strong. Now notice that. He didn't say, I wrote to you because you're weak. He said, I wrote to you because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but uh, is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Which means that those things are not in the love of God, and they're not to be in you. Amen? Amen. Now, <clears throat> we're going to cover another section very quickly. Yeah. Actually, we're going to go right on past the next section, section and we're going to do that one tomorrow night because it's kind of long. But there is, find it here. Ah. Yes. Yes. Okay. We're going back to principle dictates action, which should be, if I can help you out there a little bit, somewhere after page 23, 24, 25, something like that. Might not be marked, but that's where it's at. Principle dictates action. We may cover this some, tomorrow some too. <clears throat> now, remember, we're trying to get away from the typical church mindset. Trying to, dis to bring to fruition in you a military mindset. Now, God has declared in the Bible for you to operate by principle. Okay, now, remember, we talked about this a little bit earlier. And we're just going to cover this for just a minute because I'm going to get you out of here real quick. But I want to hit this. I want to give you something to think about. Remember, I even quoted the scripture, Psalm 119, verse 105, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, if God wanted you to operate by a direct leading or word in every situation, we would not need the Bible at all. There could be an oral transmission of the gospel to be saved, and you would not need the Bible. The Bible is a book of principle, right? Now, all through, oh man, you go back in Proverbs, even the book of Psalms, you go into Ecclesiastes. What does he say over and over again? Incline thine ear unto my words. Isn't it right? 
and he's talking about the words here that he wrote down. Now, he says, incline your ears unto my words. He says, in all you're getting, get what? Wisdom, understanding, right? In the parable of the sower, the seed that gets taken away is the seed that the person didn't understand. Go back and read Mark chapter 4. It's the seed that, it's the, the word of God that the person did not understand is what the enemy come and stole from him. Okay? Now, when it's stolen from him like that, it's because he didn't have the understanding. Whenever Solomon wrote, he said, get wisdom. And all you're getting, get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom is the ability to correctly apply knowledge. God has not ordained for you to be some machine to where he pushes the button and you operate a certain way. He wants your will submitted to his will and he wants you to find out what his will is. Now, God wills, right? He has a will and he wills. And our job is to bring his will to pass on the earth. Now, as I said earlier, you know what street you live on, but you can't find that street in the Bible. So how do you know you're in the will of God? Why? Because it's based on principle. Even in James, it says, if you're going to say, we're going to go, don't say we're going to go into this town and we're going to be prospered and do it. You say, if the Lord will. Why? Because what James is saying is, because you don't always know exactly word for word what to do and don't set your will to say, I'm going to do this and be strong-willed against even the will of God. And we're to stay open to the will of God, but get principle to operate by. You're going to go there, but do you realize that everything we do is by faith? You hearing God is by faith. Isn't that right? So therefore, there is a possibility of you being wrong. But if you operate by principle, that's why we have been as effective as we have been in healing is because we have taught people how to operate by principle. You see, you can, I'll, I'll pre, you already know this. You, you already believe it. You will come to me and say, now, I, I'm dealing with this situation, and, or I'm de, but, and, and I got that, and we got this person healed, but how would I deal with this? How would I deal with cancer? Or how would I pray against someone like that? Okay, now, since, I, since you're asking me about how to deal with, say, cancer, you're not asking about a cancer in this person, necessarily, even though you could possibly have a person, but you're trying to figure out how to deal with cancer anytime you meet it, right? not just in an, in, in an individual case. Because if it's an individual case, I'd have to have a direct word from God, okay, here's what you do. You go back in, and this cancer came from them doing this or whatever, you know, whatever it is, and you need to go out and, you know, like Jesus went up, spit in the ground, make some mud, put in their eye. Okay? That was a specific thing. Now, why did he do that? The Bible didn't say why. And always people, well, I, obviously the father told him. No. I got another answer for you. The eyes were not completely developed. And since we're made from the earth, he made and finished the creation. And then gave sight to it. That's what it was. That's what was going on. Now, you say, but didn't God tell him to do that? The Bible didn't say that. If you say it does, if you say that God told him specifically in that situation to do it, you're adding to the Bible because the Bible didn't say it. Didn't say it at all. Now, if you, if you learn to operate by principle, See, whenever you ask me how to deal with this cancer, and I tell you, guess what? You're going to deal with cancer that way from now on. Pretty much, because you're, that's how you deal with cancer. Why? It's a principle. Isn't that right? Now, <clears throat> the areas of, uh, all through the Bible, the laws of the Bible, they're all principle. And you learn to operate by principle. Treating others as you want to be treated. What's that? It's a principle. Isn't that right? He didn't say, treat the person at Walmart the way you want to be treated. He didn't say, Treat, and he didn't go into individual situations. He gave you an overall principle, right? Now, that's the way a good trainer trains everybody. You train them by principle. Why? Because you're not going to be there for every situation. You don't, I can't know every situation. I can't know every situation you're going to run into with every kind of cancer you're going to run up against. But I can give you a principle. You know what the principle is? You have authority over it. So speak to it. Tell it what you want to do. See, that's why this is simple stuff. This is, I don't give you incantations. And I don't give you some kind of certain prayer, say it this way and say that and say, no, I can give you an example. But the principle is this. Tell it, tell the cancer what you want it to do. 
Tell the body what you want it to do. Command healing. Don't beg. Don't ask. Command. That's a principle. And when you do that, you apply that principle with slight variations depending on the circumstances. You see, that's what makes a good soldier. A good soldier is able to take a situation and apply it to a principle in the Bible. Or I could say, apply a principle in the Bible to a situation. Same thing, right? Now, the greater faith you have, the less direction you need. So the greater faith you have, the more general situations you will be able to apply general commands from the Bible. See, the greatest faith is not traveling with somebody and seeing healings taking place and then you gradually building up. The greatest faith is read that Bible that says, believers lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And you go, okay. Now, does that mean for cancer? Yeah. Is a cancer person sick? Yep. Uh, does that mean for tuberculosis? So, does, so if I pray for tuberculosis, do I speak or do I lay hands? Are they sick? Yeah, lay hands. Isn't that a principle? Now, I'm not saying you have to do that because you can speak. But you know what? When you start speaking, you have just raised in faith because speaking wasn't commanded. Do you get that? You weren't commanded to speak to that cancer because that person's sick. You were commanded to lay hands. But whenever you rise to a point where you can speak to it and not lay hands, your faith has actually rose because now you're stepping out on a limb because you're doing something in a way that you weren't commanded to do it. You have Jesus as an example, but you weren't commanded. So you are applying a principle to a situation. Do you get that? That's that, you know, once you get this, it changes everything you do. It changes how you live. It change, see, once you get the principle of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, it changes your whole life. You know, all of a sudden you have to have more time to go to Walmart because you have to factor in time to pray for the sick because you're going to run across them. Isn't that right? That's the way it works. Well, but, you know, I just want to be so led by the Spirit of God that, Okay, so what you're telling me is you pass by people and you stop and they were sick and you said, God, you want that one healed? And he said, no. Is that what you're saying? It is what you're saying. And they're right, whether you're saying it or not, that's what you're saying. Now, can God say no? He's not about healing. You know why? Because healing's in the atonement. Now, could he say, don't move to Boulder? Can he tell you that? Yeah. Sure he can. And they're right. Why? Because moving to Boulder was not included in the atonement. And they're right. Anything that's included in the atonement, do I, what? What was I missing? <laughs> I think it, <laughs> Come on, now, if enough Christians move in there, it might change. Come on. <laughs> but do you understand the principle? Of what I'm saying. See, whatever is included in the atonement, it's done. He, he can't change his mind on it. He can't say something different. That's why if it has to do with healing, he can't say no. You keep trying to get him to say yes. And he doesn't have to say anything. He's already said it. It's up to you now. You know, how many times does somebody have to say, oh, you can pick up your check. It's up at the office. Well, I only heard it once. I'm not sure. <laughs> I might need a leading. <laughs> Father, you want me to pick up my check or did I just work this week for free? <laughs> See, no, you don't even think. You go pick up, why? Now, why is it you have to be led to do what he commands you to do, but yet you don't have to be led to do what he never commands you to do? You see that? Why? It's because you want to do some things. And it's funny how you always find the leading to do the things you want to do. <laughs> and the other things, it ain't your ministry. Isn't that amazing? See, this... <laughs> <clears throat> That's why I get so fed up with all the fluff in the church because all this other stuff is added in to keep you off mission. Uh, that was a question earlier. It says, uh, what is the mission? It's simple. It, it's <clears throat> Okay. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, okay, <laughs> is real simple. <clears throat> Be Jesus to the world. That's it. That's it. Just go around acting like him Say him what he would say. Treat people the way he would treat them. And any situation you come into, when you leave, leave it like heaven. Isn't that easy? That's it. Now, how do you do that? 
gospel, you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you cast out devils, you preach the gospel. That's how you do it. Anyway, right? you, you love God, you love your fellow man as yourself, and you, you treat others the way you want to be treated. That's it. You realize if you treat others the way you want to be treated, you will never violate any scripture. Do you get that? Now, you don't treat them the way they want to be treated. You treat them the way you would want to be treated. Because if you treat them the way they want to be treated, if they're a drug addict, then they're going to, you say, what do you want me to do for you? And they're going to say, give me some more drugs. But it doesn't say do that. It says treat them the way you want to be treated. In other words, if you were a drug addict, knowing what you know, but a drug addict, and you had this addiction, would you want to be set free? Sure. Well, then there you go. Why do you need to ask them anything? You don't have to say, do you want to be free? Why? Because believe it or not, you have authority over that devil in them. Well, but that's their devil. No, it ain't. It ain't a personal devil. <laughs> right? It's not their devil. It's a devil. And you have power and authority over all devils. Right. Even devils they want. You can cast it out. Well, I don't believe that. Then keep your devil. Because <laughs> it's a devil telling you that. Right? It's a doctrine of devils. That's what the Bible says. In the last days, there will be doctrines of devils. And that's what it is. Anything, that's, anything that says God can't or he won't is a doctrine of devils. Because God can and he will. Real simple. Now, <clears throat> last thing. Yeah. Philippians 2.13. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That desire in you is God's leading. It is the will of God. It is the Spirit's leading. So go with it. All right? You don't need another one. You got that one. In Jeremiah 31, 34, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Now, we all know him. Now, you said, Then why are we listening to you if we don't need to be taught? And the Bible says that well, you have no need that any man teach you, but you ever see the anointing of the Bible, and all that stuff, right? For, over in 1 John. Now, you don't, now here's the difference. You don't need me. I have to say this carefully. According to Ephesians, I'm a gift to the church. To equip and bring up. Now, but you don't need me. I can help you in your growth, but you don't need me. Because if you got in the Bible and studied it and did everything that you read that it said to do, then you would come to the same conclusions that I would take you to. So you don't need me, right? You have no need that any man teach you anything because you know all things. Well, where do you know all things? They're already here. And as you study the Word of God, this will tell you that that Word is true, and you have a witness of the Spirit, and you can just go do it. Now, where I come in is, I hopefully can help you jumpstart you. Like with the DHT, what I teach in three days, it took me 30 years to learn. And it might take you 30 years to learn it, but I can come in here and teach it to you in three days, and it jumpstarts you. So you bypass 30 years of trial and error. You see, that's, that's the benefit of an Ephesians 4 gift is that we get to jumpstart you, right? Now, but you don't need me because you have the same spirit. And you can learn on your own. It just might take you longer, right? Than what we can jumpstart. So, but notice that. <clears throat> you go down. Let me go to another verse real quick. I'm trying to find the one. Yes, verse 8. I'm sorry. On the next page. Um, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Notice he didn't say with a leading. How does he guide you with his eye? He lets you see people the way he sees them. And when you see a person in need and your heart goes out to them, if, if you were Jesus and he were in your situation and he saw that person, then you know what you were reading the Bible? And he was moved with compassion and healed them. Not moved by the Spirit. It doesn't ever say he was moved by the Spirit. It says he was moved with compassion. See, you keep trying to be led by the Spirit. You ought to just be moved by compassion. And the Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. So you have compassion. It's there. The love of God is there. And there's no law against love. So you can love that person and you can be moved with compassion and you can set them free and God has nothing to say about it other than, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Isn't that simple? I know I keep saying that over and over again, but it is just so simple. Just go about doing good and healing all that oppress the devil for God is with you. See, that's who you are. 
That's what this is about. But notice, he said, I will guide you with my eye. I'll let you see them the way I see them, and you'll be moved with compassion, and you'll set them free. And that is the leading of God. Isn't that, isn't that pretty plain? All right. Yes. <clears throat> the other we will get to tomorrow. So, did you get anything out of this tonight? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You get anything? All right. Well, we're trying to move along pretty quick. We took a little bit longer last night than I wanted to. <clears throat> you cannot always predict what the enemy is going to do or when he's going to do it. But, the, so, I should say, therefore you only have control over what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. So the secret is hit first, hit hard, keep hitting until the enemy goes down and can't get back up. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. God bless y'all. We'll see y'all tomorrow, 6 o'clock. Um, yeah.